Welcome to today's presentation on Cultural Awareness Part 2. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Lynn Dietrich is an assistant professor at the University of South Florida and faculty member of the Florida Caribbean Age Education and Training Center. She has more than 30 years of healthcare experience, spending the last 13 years as a nurse, educator, researcher, and writer. Dr. Dietrich has developed and presented educational sessions for topics on HIV, spoken at national conferences, and previously prepared two online educational modules for hospital staff. In addition to her wealth of knowledge and clinical education experience, Dr. Dietrich has published 25 peer-reviewed journal articles. She holds a doctorate in applied medical anthropology from the University of South Florida, and we welcome her to today's presentation. Dr. Dietrich, I'd like to please turn it over to you to start the presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you for attending. And this webinar is uh, we're going to continue our journey towards cultural awareness. At the conclusion of this presentation, you should be able to explain complementary and alternative medicine, otherwise known as CAM, describe how an understanding of CAM practices can enhance cultural awareness, describe the six steps in Be Safe, and describe how to apply crucial questions and be safe in interacting with patients from diverse backgrounds. In this session, we'll begin our journey towards becoming more culturally aware. Remember, this is a journey of self-awareness and growth as we learn about people and culture. So why are we talking about cultural awareness? Because as you can see from this map, 35 million adults and children are estimated to be living with HIV worldwide. That's huge. You can see from this map that no place is spared. HIV is everywhere. The worldwide reach of HIV underscores the need for health professionals to be trained in cultural awareness. We'll start with a few basic cultural concepts and then move into a discussion of cultural aspects of health and wellness. Let's start out by defining culture. This is an easy to remember definition for culture, the things that bind a group of people together. Geography can play a role as well. And people from the same area or same country may share some or all of these components, customs, language, traditions, and beliefs, but not always. And there's also um, other types of culture, like organizational culture, professional culture, such as medical, nursing, or corporate cultures each with its own customs, language, beliefs, and traditions. And it's culture that distinguishes us from our closest relatives, the great apes. Worldview uh, means how you view the world. The culture you were brought up in and the language you speak impacts your view of the world. Worldview doesn't change. This is the basics of what we believe. Worldview impacts how we see the world and make judgments. It's not based on skin but on culture. The concept of lived experience is also important to keep in mind when we talk about worldview. One needs to experience something to really understand it. For example, unless you've ridden in a wheelchair, you can't know what people who use a wheelchair are living or experiencing. One of the key underpinnings of culture is language. The language you speak at home impacts your view of the world. For example, if you speak a language that has words classified as masculine or feminine, this can impact your views on gender and conceptions about gender. If you speak a language like Navajo, you might tend to view your world in terms of dimensions. For example, in English we would describe a water glass as a glass that holds water or other liquid. If you were Navajo, you might describe the same water glass as a clear sphere that holds liquid. Do you see the difference in the descriptions? In English, it's a glass. In Navajo, it's a clear sphere that holds liquid. Obviously, from this example, Americans and Navajo see the world differently based on their language. Your language, then, can impact your perceptions and understanding of the world around you. And similarly, your language can impact your perceptions and understanding of things around you, such as the nuances of color. 
Berlin and Kay are noted linguists who wrote a book on color terms and culture. For example, some languages of people who live in tropical areas may have multiple words for shades of green, whereas in many Eskimo languages, green is just one word with no words for variations in shades of green, since much of the Eskimo world is snowy most of the time. Conversely, Eskimo languages tend to have multiple words for types of snow, whereas languages of people from tropical areas may not have a word for snow. These are just a few examples of how worldview, particularly language, affects who we are and how we see the world. Think about how you would explain snow to someone whose native language didn't have a word for snow. It would be difficult, wouldn't it? <laughs> language can also be a barrier if we don't speak the language of those around us. This is a major problem in our country. We have lots of people who speak different languages who may not be proficient in English. Similarly, there are professional languages, such as the language of medicine or science. For people who don't speak medical, for example, the language and words can be a mystery. And think about how this can impact us and our work. Language can create barriers for people seeking health care. So it's important to always remember <laughs> that things we may understand, the people we're talking to may not. Another concept that's important to understand when we talk about cultural awareness is the concept of cultural relativism. And this is the belief that other cultures and ways of doing things are different but equally valid. And this is a key concept. Adopting an attitude of cultural relativism will lead to better communication and trust. And this concept is at the heart of cultural awareness. We need to learn about other cultures in order to interact effectively with our patients and with each other. Cultural awareness education can help. So how do we become more culturally aware? By engaging with others in a purposeful way. Here's the process. Start out with respect for everyone and all cultures. Communicate. Ask about preferences and customs. Understand. Try to understand other points of view and the way other cultures look at the world. Engage. Engage everyone and be curious about people and cultures. Ask about differences. Gain comfort and experience talking with people about culture and cultural differences. You won't know unless you ask. And you'll hear cultural awareness called many things. Some people use the word cultural competency. Others may say cultural sensitivity. I like the term cultural awareness and because it, it um, implies an equal footing. It means that everybody should do it, whereas one person learning about the other and the other not having to learn. So I like the term cultural awareness. And these four stages are very clear and easy to remember. So culture can influence many aspects of people's lives. Disparities refer to differences between groups of people. These differences can affect how frequently a disease affects a group, how many people get sick, or how often the disease causes death. Some of these disparities or differences that are impacted by culture may include the way people interact with the healthcare system, individual participation in programs of prevention and health promotion, access to health information and services, health-related choices and decisions, understanding of and priorities about health and illness, and help-seeking behaviors and adherence to treatment. Health disparities can be magnified based on some of these things. Culture impacts both personal history and wider situational, social, political, geographic, and economic factors. It is because of these influences that it is essential to understand the diversity of health beliefs and practices in different cultures. Next, let's talk about cultural constructs. A cultural construct is an important term in the study of cultural awareness. Many cultures have their own ideas about life, health, and spiritual matters that have been handed down through generations. These cultural constructs sometimes differ from the scientific so it's crucial to learn what people understand about health and illness in order to effectively help them achieve improvements in their health. As you will learn, 
Not everyone believes in the Western biological model of disease causality. Many cultures define illness and health in different ways, such as the body forces being in or out of balance, or the spirit is moving you and causing a problem such as a convulsion. Mental illness may be due to heightened ability to talk to the spirits, and so forth. Some of us may have even heard our grandmothers or mothers tell us not to go out with wet hair or we would get sick, or to not walk across a cold floor with bare feet or you'll catch a cold. These are all cultural constructs about illness causation. There are also concepts such as evil eye, where someone looks at you wrong and you can get sick, or the idea that illness is due to God's will, such as the spirit moves you and you fall down. Here in the US, we use a scientific model for explaining the phenomena around us. Different cultures explain the same phenomena differently. Let's use the example of rain. In uh, the scientific model, rain is due to atmospheric conditions. In the religious model, rain is from God, so you pray for rain. In the Navajo model, the spirits of the ancestors who live in the clouds make it rain. If a person is raised with one belief system, it is difficult to change their worldview and to also change how they define health and illness. Many cultures also have explanatory models for illness. An example of an illness explanatory model is epilepsy. And I want to use the example of the Hmong. The Hmong are mountain farmers from Laos and Southeast Asia. <laughs> During the Vietnam War, many Hmong helped US troops and, as such, were in danger once the war ended. Many fled to refugee camps in Thailand and were eventually resettled here in the US during the 1980s. We're going to briefly talk about the Lee family, who were a family of Hmong farmers who were resettled in Merced, California. One of their 19 children, Leah, had seizures, so they took her to the local Hmong healer, who told them that her seizures were due to the spirit catching you and you fall down. Healer gave them traditional remedies to use for Leah and also consulted the spirits. Leah was eventually taken to the hospital where doctors diagnosed her with epilepsy. The doctors gave Leah's parents prescriptions for seizure medicine to control her epilepsy. They did not fill the prescription, preferring instead to have Leah treated by the local Hmong healer. Eventually, Child Protective Services got involved, and the child eventually died from an epileptic seizure. This is a tragic but true story about cultural disconnects. Hmong explanations for epilepsy versus Western medicine. The doctors didn't understand Hmong culture, and the Lees did not understand Western medicine. Both wanted what was best for the child. The book that details this story is excellent and is a must read for people who want to really understand how important cultural awareness training is. The book is called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. It was this book and the story of Leah Lee that helped showcase the importance of cultural awareness training for healthcare professionals. I want to talk next about CAM. CAM is the abbreviation for complementary and alternative medicine. This includes folk medicine. It is important to understand that many people, including those with chronic conditions such as HIV, use complementary and alternative medicine, including traditional healing approaches. Patients often seek out these treatments alongside their conventional medical treatment. Because complementary and alternative medicine practices are often used along with conventional medical treatment, it is important for the healthcare professional to understand these practices. It's also important to talk to the patient to find out if they are using any CAM practices, and if so, which ones. Be aware that patients might not mention that they are using these things because they may be embarrassed, they may consider it private, or they may expect the provider to ask about it. CAM knowledge is important because people choose to use these practices because they believe in them. Talking to patients about their views about health and illness can increase patient trust of the provider when the provider makes the effort to learn about the patient's culture. And there's widespread use of complementary and alternative medicine in some communities. These practices are here to stay. 
It's an important component of cultures, even in some Western societies. In our diverse world, it is essential that we understand the CAM practices of our patients in order to be more effective in our medical care of patients with diverse backgrounds. CAM practices fit into pa the patient's beliefs and worldview. Some CAM traditions can be effective in alleviating illness symptoms. These things include meditation, medical plants and herbs, acupuncture, and spirituality, as well as other practices we'll discuss today. Discussing complementary and alternative medicine practices with your patients promote patient-centered care, and integrate patient beliefs into the treatment plan. As many as 60% of people living with HIV use CAM along with ARV meds. Also, it's important to know that some herbs can interact with some of the drugs that patients may be taking for their HIV. And the importance about CAM systems are that they often treat the whole person, the mind, the body, and the spirit which is why they are so widely used. The use of traditional medicine to treat illness has been well established. Many cultures, as I said earlier, do have folk medicine traditions. These can include medicinal plants and herbs, spiritual cures, teas, potions, lotions, and aromatics, poultices, and food. These often exist alongside the scientific or medical systems. These cures are often tied in with the explanatory model of the problem the cure is for. For example, a hamong with epilepsy may consult a priest for a cure since epilepsy is believed to be caused by spirits. It's important to understand that many cultures use remedies other than pharmaceuticals to alleviate symptoms and cure illness. Many cultures have traditional healers whom people may consult when they are ill. Healers are well respected in their communities and can be called many things, including curandero, spiritista, haugen, shaman, santero, granny, root doctor, to name just a few. Healers know how to provide information in a linguistically cultural and fluent way. It is important to understand that these healers are respected members of the community and have a great deal of training and knowledge about traditional methods of healing. Let's now turn our attention to specific health belief systems. First is the system known as humoral medicine because it is based on the balance of body fluids or body humors. This belief system is based on ancient Greek medical concepts and is seen in many cultures worldwide, including the Ayurvedic system in India, the yin-yang system in China, as well as in Latin America. In some areas, it's known as the hot-cold framework. And the main point is that the body is thought to be a balance of hot and cold and wet and dry. And it includes fluids and uh, bile, water, air, things like that. Illness and food are classified based on whether they are hot, cold, wet, or dry. In this model, the assignment of something to a category is not based on the thermal temperature of the item, but rather how it's classified by people in a specific culture. Hot and cold classifications vary from culture to culture and often within cultures, so there's no set list of what is hot or cold. It's important for the clinician to determine for each patient whether his condition and proposed treatment is conceptualized in terms of the hot-cold framework by the patient and whether this conceptualization will affect the therapeutic outcome. For example, if an illness is classified as cold, then the treatment needs to be classified as hot to maintain the balance of the body humors. So a respiratory condition then might be classified as cold. Therefore, if treatment would have to be hot. So if a patient has to take a pill for that respiratory condition, they would probably take the pill with tepid or warm water, but not cold water. Similarly, if a person has a respiratory condition like a cold, they might eat hot chicken noodle soup, but they might not eat or drink anything classified as cold. So that's where part of our give chicken soup during a cold, that's part of where that came from 
this hot cold framework. So it's important to ask people in a particular culture and subcultural context if in their conception HIV is classified as hot or cold. There's no substitute for just talking with people and asking them. Next, we'll discuss key aspects of Latino traditional medicine. In this system, health consists of both physical and spiritual elements. The concepts of fatalismo, respeto, and personalismo are important components of Latino traditional medicine. Fatalismo uh, means that some people consider illness a punishment from God. Respeto uh, means that people want to be treated with respect. And personalismo is the ex expectation of a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with the provider. And I want to make clear that there's great cultural diversity among Latinos. And so it's important not to stereotype. But sometimes there can be reluctance from Latinos to use Western medical services due to economic or political reasons. Key issues could include language barriers, cultural beliefs, uh, lack of health insurance, fear of immigration status having to be divulged, or finances. The point about this particular um, slide is that Latinos expect humility from health care providers. Family is often involved in medical care, in office visits, and in treatments, so families should be welcomed. Similarly, HIV is often considered God's punishment, and folk medicine can be viewed as complementary to Western medicine. Curanderos serve as an influential source of medical advice for some people in Latin America. Patients in many cultures sometimes exclude conventional medical care and prefer using someone from their own culture that they trust for their care. Curanderos in Latin American culture serve as, as an important resource for treatment when Western health services are unwanted or unavailable. Curanderos provide treatment for a whole host of conditions in a culturally acceptable way. The emphasis is on holistic treatment and the link between spiritual, emotional, and social factors important to Latino patients. Sometimes people consult a curandero or a similar healer while they're also being treated by a physician. So it's important to ask patients about other forms of treatment they may be receiving. Curanderos may offer herbal remedies that have negative interactions with some conventional HIV drugs, so it's important to know what your patients are using. Also, curanderos have historically worked cooperatively and effectively with regular clinicians, thereby increasing the clinician's reach and effectively communicating health information. And because curanderos are, are often very influential members of the community, it's important to know that they're there and that what they say is taken often very seriously by people who visit them. Botanicas are stores that sell traditional herbal medicine and items associated with spiritual healing, such as saints' candles, santeria ceremonial shells, and other religious items. These stores are often focal points of the Latino community since they often also provide health treatment and information. It should be pointed out that many cultures have similar stores with similar sources, herbs and health, tre health treatment and information. As an example, walk through Chinatown in any major city and you will probably come across at least one and probably more herbal medicine stores. Providers need to understand that botanicos and herbal medicine stores and know that they are an important part of many communities. And since many cultures use herbal remedies, it's important to ask about those. Botanicos and herbal medicine stores in many communities also serve as a source of support and health information. Sometimes curanderos are based in botanicos. People go to botanicos because the service in these botanicos resonates with their cultural understandings of health and illness. And as I said earlier, patients may be using folk remedies along with ARV drugs that may interact with each other. Therefore, it's important to ask patients what types of treatments they may have received from botanicos and curanderos. 
Also, some of these remedies may be referred to as food supplements. So you want to ask your Latino patients if they're using food supplements. Also, um, some traditional medicines for HIV symptoms that you might find at a botanico include cat's claw and dragon's blood. So if patients say they're using those, you'll need to understand what those are. I want to briefly talk about Muslim patients. Muslim religious practices regarding sex can act as a protection against HIV. However, it's still important to understand that HIV can show up in patients who practice Islam. Many Muslims feel they are safe from HIV due to the teachings of their religion about sex. Some associate HIV infection with non-religious acts such as sex outside of marriage. The Muslim view of health is usually fatalistic, meaning that it's out of an individual's control and it's in Allah's hands. Therefore, patients may sometimes see health-related behavior as being of little consequence. It is important also to understand the importance of gender roles and chaperones in this culture. Women usually do not travel alone and are often accompanied to medical visits by male relatives or their husbands. It's not uncommon for male relatives or husbands to want to be present during examination and consultations. Female patients may avoid direct eye contact with providers of the opposite sex. Muslims tend to be comfortable being cared for by providers of the same gender, and modesty, especially among females, is important. Also, in many cultures, hand signals are considered rude, and thumbs up can be interpreted as a rude gesture in some Muslim cultures. So it's important not to make hand gestures like thumbs up when you're dealing with a lot of patients from different cultures. They may be misunderstood as rude and can really sour relationships. We have a large number of Haitian patients here in Florida, so it's important to understand aspects of Haitian culture. Voodoo, and note the spelling, this is the correct spelling of voodoo, is an important cultural tradition in many parts of Haiti. Voodoo is a religion and lifestyle with roots in 18th century Africa and is practiced in parts of Haiti, Caribbean, and Africa, and also in some parts of the U.S. Voodoo is often misunderstood as evil and associated with zombies, in large part due to movies and TV. The magic of voodoo is believed to bring good fortune and healing. There are many Haitian natural and traditional healers, and some don't practice voodoo, but it should be noted that as many as 80 to 90 percent of Haitian and Haitian American households utilize CAM of some sort, including voodoo. When you know that 80 to 90 percent of your Haitian and Haitian American households are utilizing some sort of complementary and alternative medicine, it's important to understand that and ask the right questions so that you know what you're going to do for them and how the medicines you're going to give them won't counteract with what else they may be doing. So many Haitians use a three-stage approach to health care. First, they may try folk medicine, teas or herbs with medicinal properties. If that doesn't work, they might consult with a haugan or a mambo for spiritual cleansing to rid the body of disease. Third, they may end up going to a local clinic or medical center for health care if things worsen or the folk medicine isn't effective. Sometimes, too, the Haugen or Mambo might refer a patient to a physician if voodoo isn't working. Traditional voodoo practices include the use of magic and sorcery as part of their ceremonies. This is not just limited to voodoo. When dealing with Haitian patients, it's important to ask them how they would describe what is wrong with them. They might not admit to using voodoo practices, in part due to the social stigma associated with voodoo in this country. So it's important to know how the patient describes their disease. And just as a side note, SIDA is the word for AIDS in French, and HIV is referred to as VIH in French, and French, or a type of Creole French, is the native language of Haiti. So if you hear them use the word CETA or VIH, 
you'll know that they're referring to either AIDS or HIV. And remember, too, that people may not always have the scientific names for an illness. They may not call AIDS AIDS. They may call it CETA. They may not know what the scientific name is. So sometimes you have to ferret out what people mean when they're using cultural terms. Santeria is another spiritual practice with origins in Africa that is seen in cultures in the Caribbean, Cuba, Latin America, and parts of Africa. We also see Santeria practiced in some areas here in the U.S. Santeria is similar to voodoo and other traditional spiritual practices. The name derives from the word santo, meaning saint. It is a blend of Catholicism and African religious traditions. In Santeria, the belief is that the spiritual world has forces and entities that can lend support to healing. The concept of internal balance of body forces and spiritual and social well-being are key elements of Santeria. Santeria uses ritual dancing, songs, herbs, prayer, tarot cards, and trance to address physical issues associated with illness, including HIV. There is a heavy use of herbs, tobacco, and also a focus on inducing a trance-like state through dancing, invocation, and herbs to help facilitate healing. It's important to know that Santeria is a practice that some people may use for spiritual guidance as well as for healing. Some Santeria treatments include the use of alcohol and tobacco. So it's important to understand that because some of the HIV meds that patients may be receiving shouldn't be used with alcohol or tobacco. So you need to know whether or not a patient is practicing Santeria and if they are, are they using treatments that include alcohol and or tobacco. And it's also worth noting that the Santeria community has a long history of creating networks of social support for people with HIV and AIDS. So it's, it's important to know then that you do have the social support network within the Santeria community. Okay, next let's talk about Chinese traditional medicine or TCM. This has been practiced in Asia for more than 5,000 years. As you can see from this slide, key components of Chinese medicine include the concept of body balance and yin and yang to maintain health. Illness is thought to be due to internal imbalances. The goal is to correct imbalances to allow the body to heal itself and restore balance and health. Herbal stores are often found in Asian communities, and people who work in these stores are often experts in herbal medicine and other healing met methods, including acupuncture and Zen. Harmony and avoidance of conflict are hallmarks of Asian culture. Respect, deference to authority, and tradition are important. Asian patients are often stoic about pain and may not vocalize when they are in pain. It's also important for you to understand that in some cultures, it's not considered polite for patients to ask questions of physicians so you may find a patient nodding their head. You think they understand, but they may not. Okay, briefly, Zen is another form of a Chinese meditation practice that also has been around for thousands of years. Again, you see the concept of body harmony, and illness is thought to occur when these three things, Jing, Qi, and Shen, are out of balance. And Zen practices have shown to promote overall sense of well-being and quantifiable benefits in pain management, neuropathy, high blood pressure, and immunity strength. Zen practitioners regard meditation as a key preventative health strategy and therapeutic treatment. Acupuncture is the art of inserting fine sterile metal needles into specific body points on the body to control the flow of energy. And again, you have the concept of balance. And qui is the life force that when out of balance, illness occurs. It's important to understand that acupuncture specialists are licensed and have their own forms of diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, and therapies. Acupuncture is often combined with herbs. And acupuncture is often sought out by many people, not just Asians, but many people, including people of color, for treatment of HIV throughout the US. Acupuncture is viewed as culturally appropriate and a safe treatment modality 
when it's done by a licensed provider. Okay, naturopathic medicine basically is the belief that the body has an innate healing ability and it's based on meditation and the use of herbs and the nat power of nature to heal. Spirituality and faith are important practices that promote quality of life for many people with HIV. And spirituality is an important component of many cultures, and spiritual and faith practitioners can be important sources of guidance during illness. OK, now that we've reviewed some cultural health traditions, we need to look at how we can create culturally appropriate therapeutic care environments for our patients. Culturally appropriate care means creating an environment in which the best medical practices can be safely accessed and people feel welcome. Learning about culture is one way to achieve this goal. So how do we create a safe, warm, and welcoming environment? Part of creating a welcoming environment is examining your organization for effective communication. Effective communication is essential in working with people from different backgrounds and cultures. This chart illustrates how important it is to communicate effectively with people at every point of contact. Speaking the same language is not enough. You need to assure that understanding is the same. And you might want to use a secret shopper to help you with this. I'd like to turn now to an acronym called Be Safe, which will help you become more effective in communicating with your patient. So each letter stands for a specific behavior that's part of the patient encounter. B stands for barriers to care. The provider should be aware of possible barriers to care for patients in their service area. This includes mistrust of the medical system, stigma, bias, and clinician bias, among other things. E stands for ethics. Demonstrate mutual respect for all patients. This includes telling the truth, honoring the patient's perspective, and autonomy and confidentiality. S stands for sensitivity of the provider. Know your own personal biases and prejudices and try to overcome them by learning about other cultures and traditions. Show empathy, maintain privacy, and confidentiality. A is for assessment. It's important to focus on the whole person during assessment. Relate findings to the context of the patient's own cultural background. F is for facts. Know the facts about your patient and HIV and how culture, age, sexual practices, economics, and drug use may impact them. Ask about cultural practices. And E, encounters. Provide patients with information that is simple and clear and make sure they understand. Use teach back or an interpreter if necessary. Pay attention to body language, tone of voice, and eye contact. The crucial question on the next slide can help you find out many of these be safe elements. It's important to understand that diagnosis of HIV or AIDS carries a stigma. So these crucial questions that are on this particular slide were developed by Arthur Kleinman, who was a prominent uh, psychiatrist and medical anthropologist. And these questions can help you engage your patients. And I would recommend pick one that you're comfortable with and use that as your conversation starter when talking to patients. And it's important to understand that even gestures matter. Many cultures tend to view hand gestures as rude or offensive. So avoid gestures such as thumbs up, beckoning with an index finger, hang 10, pointing, OK, and other things. Similarly, in some cultures, direct eye contact is not made due to issues related to respect or impropriety if people are of the opposite gender from the provider. Chaperones are often expected for patients of the opposite gender from the provider, and humor can often be misunderstood. So I just want to show you again the cultural awareness uh, model and the fact that it's important to have respect, to communicate, to understand, and engage. So in summary then, uh, these were the objectives for today's webinar. We've discussed complementary and alternative medicine. We've learned how an understanding of CAM can enhance cultural awareness. We've talked about the six steps of the Be Safe model. 
and we've discussed how to apply crucial questions and be safe in interacting with patients. Finally then, an important part of the journey towards becoming culturally aware is examining yourself and knowing your own bias. Understand how others see you. Become curious about cultures. Keep talking and learning. Implement some of the tools discussed today, including be safe and crucial questions. This is a journey of self-awareness and growth for all of us. As we conclude, I want to leave you with another look at this map as a reminder about why cultural awareness is important. HIV is a worldwide problem, and over 35 million people worldwide are living with HIV. Our patients are diverse. So it's imperative that we know about the diverse cultural and health practices of the people we care for in our work. Remember, this is a journey. So today, we've begun to learn about people and cultures and how they view health and illness. As you continue your journey towards becoming culturally aware, I hope you will find it rewarding. Remember, this is a journey of self-awareness and growth, so enjoy it. And then these are some of the rep books and things. If you're interested in learning more, they'll be available in the slides that you can print out. And then these are the references for some of those materials. And I want to thank you for attending today. And now we can take questions. I do have one question that has come in. Uh, at one point, you talked about a lot of cultures wanting somebody to, not only the patient, but a family member to be in with them when they are discussing things. How would you address the issue of confidentiality before you're allowed to have that other person back in the room with you? Well, I think that that's a, that's a good question, and it's a tricky one. Um, I think it's whether or not the patient agrees. And sometimes you have to separate the patient from the family member you know, if it's something such as uh, domestic violence or abuse, then you might need to um, ask the patient, for example, if they'd like to go to the restroom. And then when they're out of the room, ask them if they would like to have that other people in the room with them. Okay, so while in a lot of cases it really doesn't matter, I think that you have to be aware that if it is a case where there may be abuse or domestic violence, it's important to understand that. Also, it's important to understand that you have to make sure the patient has a chance to speak for themselves and that the person who's with them is not doing all the talking. Some cultures do have beliefs where it's, it's not considered appropriate for a woman to talk to a man. So if it's a male provider and a female patient and the husband is there, the husband may do the talking. So it's important to be aware that sometimes there are cultural things that can impact that. But in terms of confidentiality, I think it's up to the patient and what they feel comfortable with. OK, great. What methods, um, if a patient takes other remedies, such as herbal medications that you mentioned, what is the role of the case manager in talking to either the patient and or the physician in order to make sure that everybody is aware those alternate uh, methods and remedies are being used in conjunction with their other medications? Well, that's a good question. And I think that this is where some of the um, be safe questions or the uh, crucial questions can help. For example, you can ask them, what kind of treatment do you think you should receive? How does your illness work? What are you currently doing for your illness? And remember, too, that sometimes herbal remedies are referred to as food supplements. So it's important to understand what those food supplements are. You may have to do some research, especially if they say they're taking something like cat's claw or dragon's blood, um, or if they practice Santeria, where they may be using tobacco or alcohol. But again, that's something that you're going to have to try to ferret out as best you can. And it's hard, but that's part of um, what we have to do to really be effective with our patients. So where could we find out more about using the Be Safe model? Well, we have the handouts here on the available for download. And if, pay, if people want to go to the 
National Minority AIDS Education and Training Center on the internet. They can find out more about it. Plus, we'll be in the spring having more training on that model going forward. And what do I do if a patient doesn't seem to understand what we're saying to the patient? How do we address that with the patient? Well, it's important to understand teach back, and it's important to make sure you have a trained interpreter. Okay, it's not always good to have a family member translate because family members may not know the correct terminology, and you'll find that with a trained interpreter, they will translate exactly what the provider is saying, whereas a family member may not be completely correct in the word-for-word uh, -word translation. Also, there are things that are not always appropriate for family members, like you don't want a child. So it's important for providers to, to make sure that they have some sort of translation service available, whether it's the language line telephone system, trained interpreters, or something similar. And also be aware that in some cultures, patients aren't, it's not considered appropriate to ask questions because of issues related to respect. So, for example, in Asian culture, it's not considered polite to ask questions of a respected physician. So the patient may nod their head and seem like they understand. So you really have to use teach back, and you really have to work to, to make sure they understand. OK, here is a question. <clears throat> Why only include Navajo and Muslim religions in this study when a large Christian community think of HIV as some kind of God's punishment? OK, well, first of all, in um, an hour, I couldn't possibly include everything. So I tried to give a smattering of things that people might be less familiar with. I can obviously do in future sessions more about the various Christian and Protestant beliefs. But I wanted to focus on things that were not as common and things I felt that were important for providers to know about things like Santeria and Voodoo and some of the Zen and CAM practices. Another question that was asked is, can you actually ask the patient, have you told your doctor that you're taking this non-traditional medication? I wouldn't put it exactly that way. I would say, you know, please make sure you tell the doctor that you're using herbal teas. I wouldn't call them non-traditional medications. But that's not culturally, um, really a culturally appropriate way to say it. So I would say something like, please make sure you talk to your doctor and, and let him or her know about anything that you're taking, like teas or things like that. How would you effectively use a translator who may summarize questions or answers? I think that it's important to have someone who's trained. More and more health facilities are starting to go with trained or certified interpreters who are trained exactly how to do the interpretation, for example, they're trained to stand behind the provider. And this way, then, they're looking at the patient, but they're trained to say exactly what the doctor says. So I think it's, a, it's an issue of, of training. And you'll find that more and more hospitals and agencies are uh, either using language line or they're training their interpreters how to interpret correctly so that they don't summarize. Well, thank you all for your wonderful questions. And Dr. Dietrich, thank you for your wonderful presentation today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center's mission is to ensure that physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, pharmacists, case managers, and other healthcare professionals in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands receive state-of-the-art information, training, and consultation on the prevention, chronic disease management, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Funding is provided by the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides a variety of HIV AIDS education, training, consultation, and resources. Visit our website, www.fcaetc.org, to learn more. Stay in touch with us by joining our mailing and email list. You will receive notices about upcoming educational opportunities, as well as new and updated HIV AIDS resources. 
You may also sign up to receive our HIV CareLink newsletter. Visit our website, fcaetc.org, and click on Join Our Mailing and Email List at the top of the homepage. Be sure to also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Florida Caribbean AETC provides consultation services to clinicians in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you have questions related to the content of this program or would like consultation on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS and related conditions, we would love to hear from you. We also offer consultation on the interpretation of resistance test results. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash consultation to ask your question today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides pocket-sized treatment guideline resources that detail the federally approved HIV AIDS medical practice guidelines such as the adult antiretroviral therapy, hepatitis, pediatric antiretroviral therapy, adult opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, and occupational PEP. In addition, we have summarized common practices for the post-exposure prophylaxis in pediatrics adolescents. We have also developed resources that provide an overview for treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in HIV-infected patients and therapeutic agents for oral manifestations. Visit our website to download or request copies of these resources. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides web-based educational opportunities to increase the knowledge and skills of HIV healthcare providers. Live and on-demand options are available. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash education for more information. Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, Project ECHO, provides a web-based didactic presentation on a current HIV treatment issue based upon current Department of Health and Human Services and other accepted treatment guidelines. Project ECHO also provides an opportunity to discuss case presentations submitted by participants and an opportunity to network with both your peers and HIV experts. All members of care and treatment teams, including case managers, are welcome to participate. Information discussed is targeted at providers with basic or intermediate HIV AIDS treatment experience. Choose from four session types. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash echo to view upcoming sessions and to register. If you are located outside of our region, the Clinician Consultation Center provides consultation services via the phone numbers listed here. Or you may also visit www.nccc.ucsf.edu for more information. To locate the AETC in your region, visit www.aidsetc.org.